everyone welcome back to my channel my name is Jenny um, I'm here today to start my February reading wrap-up and I started off uh, my first finish is The Descendants by Cowie Hart Hemmings this is a uh, novel um, set in Hawaii on two of the islands of Hawaii and uh, it follows it's a family drama so um, I had seen the film um, starring George Clooney years ago when it came out, and, but I don't think I remembered a ton about the the plot. Um, a little bit, but basically we when the story opens, um, we find Max King, a father of two um, young gish daughters. Um, dealing with the fact that his wife has gone into, is in a coma because of a boat, boating accident. And the plot ensues from there to um, him realizing a lot of different things um, around um, his wife's recovery or, or non-recovery, around his relationship with his daughters and his presence in the family as a father. Um, and at the same time as that this is going on, he's also dealing with the fact that he has a land trust that is coming due and he's supposed to make a decision about selling this piece of land, this piece of land that was um, bequeathed to his family by um, his ancestor who was a Hawaiian princess who married a settler man. And so... Um, it's it's a a story that um I, I i found it very very compelling story it's a story about a man a person trying to come to terms with huge changes in his life huge upheavals and things are revealed along the way um i guess if you've seen the film you probably know the plot but i don't want to um you know talk about them here because I think that as you uncover these things and as they as you're following along on this journey on this quest there's a quest involved in this there's there's a lot of learning a lot of growth that the family goes through as they're going through this process and so you learn about Hawaii as a place and as a culture but also you are wrapped up in this family drama and I think it was very well done I found I was very invested in the characters and in their lives and in the things they were going through um, I think that um, Cowie Hart Hemmings is a great writer. I think she captured um, a really hard and poignant thing in a very well done way. Um, it felt very true. It felt very authentic to me. And so I, I really enjoyed this. I thought she did a great job with it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I'll say for now. And uh, I will check in again with you when I have finished another book. Hey everyone. Okay, I actually have two books to wrap up for you that I finished this week. First one is Chris Hadfield's An Astronaut's Guide to Life on, on Earth. Uh, this is a memoir and kind of a combination of memoir and sort of self-help, but I wouldn't really say it's like strong on the self-help part. It's more about him sharing his philosophy and the way he's looked at his life and the way he achieved his goal of becoming an astronaut. So I, I think it was very relatable. His uh, writing style is very conversational. And uh, even though he was talking a lot about NASA and the International Space Station and um, like his training in Russia, uh, it, it, there's you know it gets there's a lot of like names of other astronauts and people that he um encountered along his journey but there's there's a really great sense of of his chris hadfield's way of looking at life and how he approaches how astronauts in general kind of approach um their field which was quite fascinating and then also how chris hadfield himself achieved his goals and the thing the way he looked at things and his perspective and how that created a really positive mostly positive experience for him 
in his life when he was achieving this big goal. So it's a really um, great book. Um, I read it with Elliot, who's 12, and he really enjoyed it as well. So I think that, um, there he is. Uh, I think that I would recommend this because I think that it has um, a very uplifting uh, perspective and it also explains a lot of the behind the scenes of astronaut life that you may be interested in learning about um, since you will probably most people will never be astronauts. So uh, learning about the behind the scenes of that process was quite interesting. So yeah, I, I would recommend this. I thought it was quite good. And then the other book I finished was also nonfiction, Women in the Picture, What Culture Does with Female Bodies by Catherine McCormick. This is a wonderful piece of feminist um, art history literature, but also just feminist literature in general, I would say, um, because this is about art history, but it's about how art history relates to the way that women are um, perceived in our society and also the way that our culture has um, been constructed in order to keep women in certain categories, namely in this book that she's they're divided into specific categories such as the Venus, so this sexually available beautiful woman, the mother, the kind of uh, maternal figure on her various forms but obviously based on the Virgin Mary as in art history, and um, the maiden and dead damsel, so this idea of this violated woman uh, a woman who is um, a victim of, of danger and violence, and then the monstrous woman. So this woman who is dangerous, she is knowledgeable, she is powerful, she will um, hurt you. So these are the kind of archetypes um, that Catherine McCormick dissects in this book. Uh, this book is a very, very um affecting for me there's a lot of things in here about you know where europe got its name where the city of rome got its name that i didn't know these myths behind these stories behind these these names that we just take for granted and don't see in our society unless we have studied these things and so unveiling a lot of this stuff was really really quite uh, amazing to hear and to learn about I think this is a super important book. Um, I think that, um, you know, if you are interested in feminist scholarship, this is a definite read and I would recommend it highly. Um, I'm going to be thinking about this book for a really long time. It's possible that I may do a review on this book. Um, I'm going to just let it sink in for a while and see if I feel compelled to do that. But um, a super important read if you are interested in dissecting women's role in culture. Good morning, everybody. I finished Wild Imperfections, uh, an anthology of womenist poems last night. Uh, this was compiled and edited by Natalia Molabazzi and forwarded by Bernadine Avaristo. This is a collect, <clears throat> sorry, this is a collection of poems um, from all over, Africa and the African diaspora. And I would say each poet gets about two to three poems, sometimes four, depending on um, whatever the editor decided. Uh, this was These poems are collected, I think, mostly by an open call. And they cover topics like all over the map, which I think was a real strength of the collection. Um, because there are some really serious poems, really, you know, political poems. Some of them are very personal about love, about um, female genital mutilation, about um, colonization. There are poems about um, being queer, um, you know, birth, um, children, um, all, all the experiences of being a woman that you can imagine, I think, are represented in this collection. Um, I thought there were some amazing poems in here, and I thought that it was a very mostly well, together, uh, well put together collection. I did find near the end, 
I found it a bit long. So maybe for me, um, if there could have been maybe five to 10 less um, inclusions just to keep it a bit more, I don't know, it just started to drag a little bit near the end for me. Um, not because I think the quality of the poems lagged, but more just because it's, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure what that feeling came from. Um, so I thought I would read you two of the poems in here just to give you a sense. I mean, it's hard because, like I said, there's different poets, so they have different narrative voices and they sh they have a different kind of vibe, but they do flow really well throughout the collection. So this poem is by L.B. Williams and it's called Little Black Boy. Little black boy, what name do they call you by? Is it Malcolm, Martin, Nat, or do they use your surname, Mandela, Sabukwe, Biko? Is it the commoner's name, thug, gangster, incorrigible? Is it your American name, slave, n-word, coon? Is it your school name, hopeless, dumb, disrespectful? Or is it your institution name, inmate, criminal, convict? Little black boy, I sometimes wonder why they just don't call you the name your mama gave you, love. So I thought that was beautiful. Obviously, this is a poem about men written by, by uh, a female identifying person, but um, I, I, I still thought it was very, very affecting and powerful. And then, oh yeah, I really liked this one. This is Diana Ferris. My mother was a storm. My mother was a storm, a sky filled with dark clouds. She could threaten or burst open. She gave warnings before she lashed her thundering tongue, uprooting old dead trees, theories. My mother cleaned with an iron duster. She swept away all dirt and falsehoods. My mother risked having her name tarnished, but could not be tamed. I did not want to see her rain down so freely. She had to stop before it became too wet. I feared her drowning. I feared those floods that made me gasp for air. I thought my mother was too intense a winter, knew she carried a summer, but one in which flash floods hid. Oh, but how I long for that storm now, a fierce and all-encompassing one, these days in which hard rocks bash, tear at skin and soul. I wish my mother could enter the sky and with an angry wind gather the clouds, rain down hard and dissolve those rocks so intact, so smug. Today, I need my mother. I thought that was really beautiful. So yeah, this is a really great collection. I would highly recommend it if you like poetry. And they also do a, um, at the end, they, they talk about all the, all of the poets and give a little biography so that if you were searching out um, poets, you would be able to find more information about them. So very good collection. And I'll check in again with you when I'm finished another book. Hey everyone. So I finished The Known World by Edward P. Jones, and I read this with um, Dee Dee from Brown Girl Reading and her Read Soul Lit Read Along, which happens in February and July each year. So this book won the Pulitzer Prize in 2003, I believe. No, wait, that's wrong. Not 2003. Um, I think this was published in... Oh, it was published in 2003, so I think he probably won the Pulitzer Prize either that year or the year after. Okay, so this is a super unique novel. Uh, I doubt you ever read a novel similar to this. The, the storytelling method that Edward P. Jones uses is starts off with a lot of characters. First of all, there's multiple characters in this story. And I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a main character, but there's a lot of anchor characters that you follow throughout the story. It's set in Virginia in a fictional county. Um, apparently, um, Edward P. Jones used a lot of the uh, he made this up in in his imagination. There wasn't a, it wasn't something that he did a lot of research on. But the way he presents the story makes it seem like there's historical records that he's referring to um, about the characters and the people. So we follow Henry Townsend, who is our main character, who is a black man whose father um, was f worked to free himself, then freed his wife, then freed his son Henry from the. 
uh, white slave owner, main slave owner of the area, William Robbins. And Henry grows up with this craving for power, and he doesn't question the world he lives in. Um, the Known World is a very apt title for this book because all of the characters, you experience the world that they live in and the world that they see and the potential of the world that they see through who they are as characters in the book. Henry does not want to change anything. He just wants power in the world that he's in. And he therefore goes on to purchase land with the help of this slave of his former slave of his former owner who likes him who takes a shine to him who's he 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 treats him like a pet um he also purchases slaves and so he is a black slave owner so you know you don't th- I don't think this is something that's covered a lot in the history of slavery, so I found that very interesting. And so you see a whole echelon of society, a whole class of society based on the people living in this county from the white slave owners. And then um, William Robbins also has a black um, woman that he has children with, and he likes those children and better than his his other child and so he he favors them and he gives them privilege and so there's 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 colored people in this county who have privilege and there's and it goes on down the line to um to slaves and so it's a study of class it's a study of a system of of the system of slavery and how it functioned in many different aspects of society um it's a story of um of scope there's a lot of scope here as well um into a a broader discussion about power about access about um agency about what you will and will not not accept about things going on around you um there are so many characters in here that were really inspired. I actually just finished the live stream um, that uh, Dee Dee did for for people to discuss together. So it was really interesting hearing people's opinions about the characters. I didn't fall in love with any of the characters. And that's why this book was four stars for me instead of five stars. Um, but what what the uniqueness of the storytelling, which is where I started, and I'll go back to that for a minute, is that in each character you would be introduced to them and sometimes you would hear about the way their lives ended before you even had a context for them in the story itself that you're in in this moment so there's a time jumps um but the way he does the time jumps um you know is kind of short story like but it's also um it's very affecting in some ways because there's something kind of satisfying about knowing the end of a character when you just met them it gives you a context for the scope of their life that you know when you have multiple multiple characters in a book and you don't give that context for who they become later um you have to go through the story to build that context, right? But you can't build that much context for so many characters at once. It's just not possible. So Edward P. Jones gives you a little gift of like introducing you to someone who then you know that they died when they were 94 and they were living in this particular town and they had this that was the big thing in their life. And you just get this little snippet. It happens for most of the characters in the book, even if they're small characters, even if they're not as prominent in the story. Um, And I think that could be disorienting for some people, but I found it quite a unique method of storytelling that I'd never encountered before. And therefore, it really drew me into the story. Um, I think I understand this winning the Pulitzer. I think there's a scope to this story, like a wideness and a complexity to all the layers that is quite impressive to read and to be part of. Um, you don't like a lot of the characters in here because <laughs> they are, uh, you know, a lot of them are really terrible people or do terrible things. Um, but overall, um, I think the story ends in a very satisfying way and you get a sense of um, how 
humans, you know, no matter how small your life is, how it moves through a broader sense of time and place. And um, I really like that as well with this whole aspect of telling us the future of some of these characters is that we're not going to know that in the story. We're not going to be with that character in that time of their life, but we know that it happened. And so again, as a character reader, it's a very satisfying way to learn about these characters because you feel like you know more about them than you get to see in this snippet of story. So, um, so it's a very complex story, uh, kind of about the downfall of a certain plantation, but also about the, the layers of slavery as an institution and how it was built upon so many different types of people being um being held in a certain place in society um the poor white people had to do a certain thing the people who married out of their race were uh, allocated a certain status um there were people who were against what was happening but they were so passive in their approach that they condoned a lot of things because they just they didn't stand for anything they just kind of were wishy-washy about this institution of slavery because they didn't feel like they had any agency to do anything about it when they most certainly did um so yeah so many interesting things some questions um it's um it's it's quite it, the text in this edition this is the um the soft cover is quite small and it's 388 pages so it's you know it it feels like it shouldn't be it didn't shouldn't take you that long to read but it, i think it actually took me a while because the text was so small and also the characters there's so many characters, so it is easy to get them mixed up. Um, and I did have that happen to me from time to time, but it wasn't, it didn't happen enough that it made me upset too much about the story. I just kept moving on through. So uh, that is The Known World by Edward P. Jones, one of my reads for Black History Month. And I will check in with you again when I finish another book. Hey, everybody. Um, I just finished another book, so I wanted to catch you up on my reading. I finished listening to 1984 by George Orwell. Um, I found the audiobook on Spotify and so tried it out on there. So, I mean, dystopian novels, classic dystopian novels are classic dystopian novels. Um, I'm not going to get into the plot here. I think most people know what 1984 is about. A lot of coins were termed from that novel. So Big Brother, for instance, <clears throat> was a term created by George Orwell in 1984 for an overseeing government that controls everyone and wreaks havoc on everyone, basically. So... I have a very similar feeling about all these types of classics, and that is that in a lot of cases, you don't read this to enjoy it. So it was interesting to listen to one person reviewing it saying that they enjoyed it, and I thought, you did? <laughs> okay. Because to me, to enjoy a novel such as this where the people are existing in subpar lives where they're not enjoying anything they're just um you know towing the line of a tyrannical government system uh not a book i enjoy reading to be honest and i read brave new world by aldous huxley many years ago in high school and if you're comparing them i feel like i got more out of brave new world than i got out of 1984 but I, again, I can't really remember Brave New World that well either. Uh, I just found that the tone was not my favorite type of tone. So very, you know, waxing poetical, like waxing philosophical, <clears throat> excuse me, waxing philosophical about, um, about the system and the ideas behind the system. There was, you know, 
portions of chapters where Winston, our main character, is just reading the book about Big Brother and about Big Brother's philosophies. And, um, you know, there's not much, like, it, like, it's about ideas. It's about the extreme of humanity and humanity pushing, humans pushing other humans to terrible ends. And so it's about brainwashing. It's about propaganda. It's about uh, power. So, I mean, I'm glad that I listened to it on some levels because now I know what that novel is and what it's about. Um, I can understand the references if people make references to them. Uh, I, I read this basically because of the retelling that has come out called Julia, written from Julia's perspective. And I do feel interested in reading Julia's perspective. And that is because I like 1984 is not a feminist novel. I found uh, it, you know, had a lot of misogynistic tone to it. A lot of um, the women were described very harshly. Um, Julia was beautiful, but then once she had gone through torture, she wasn't beautiful anymore. She was cold and cadaver-like. Um, I mean, the men weren't described in glowing physical terms either, but there was just, I think when you're reading from a male perspective and you, you know, there's always a comment about the quality of the women's breasts and different things like that. Like, I find that frustrating because you know, when you're, when you're reading the character Winston describing a male character, he's not referring to the same physical quality on every single man. Whereas with a woman, it always becomes about what her breasts are doing in relation to the rest of her body. So if she has perky breasts versus, you know, pendulous sagging breasts or something like this, like those types of things are not things that men writing in the 1940s were thinking about, you know, in terms of their female readers and how they would react to that. So I'm not expecting there to be, you know, like a, an equal representation for the women here, but I'm interested in the idea that someone is taking that story and making it feel more feminist in its tone. So that's 1984. I, 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 I don't... You know, I read it. Um, is it a brilliant novel to me? No, it's not. But I understand why it is to other people. I understand, you know, where it sits in the lexicon here. But I, I just, I just don't. The things that I get out of books are not these things. They're not about ideas and they're not about pushing the envelope. I thought it was a very, like, listening to someone endure torture for chapter after chapter is very difficult and um and the ending was um you know didn't surprise me at all I thought the ending was fitting for the rest of the novel it made sense in terms of what had gone on the whole time like th there's not going to be some miraculously happy ending in a story like this there there can't be there's no happiness in the anywhere in the story no one's happy how could there be a happy ending <laughs> So I wasn't expecting that. Um, and I felt like uh, Room 101 was an obvious thing. Like what happened in Room 101 was obvious. And I felt like maybe it was a bit too obvious for me. A bit too like, oh yeah, this is the last thing. This is the last stand and... And because ultimately I didn't even really believe the relationship between Winston and Julia were very, was very strong in the first place. I don't know. Uh, to me, like they they didn't have a great love story. It wasn't like some sort of a beautifully constructed, you know, connection between the two of them. It seemed rather pedestrian. It seemed rather, uh, you know, it seemed like an idea. It seemed like they liked the idea of loving each other. Um, and then this idea of breaking that love was somehow the last vestige of power. 
uh, to be able to change someone's internal feeling, to be able to alter um, how you feel inside of yourself is the ultimate show of power, right? That's that's the message of the story. Uh, it's horrific and terrible. Um, and that was the message. <laughs> so anyway, those are my feelings about 1984. I read it, I listened to it, and I'm, I was very relieved when I didn't have to listen to it anymore. And I'll be back and check in again when I've got another book finished. <clears throat> hey everyone. So I, my last finish of February was going to be Winter by Ali Smith. Um, so my initial idea was to read her whole quartet in each season um, as I go like the way she wrote them because she wrote them in kind of like a year consecutively and published them really fast. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do that at, because I've read autumn and winter now. I think I might take a break and read spring and summer next year or something. I'll, I'll wait and see. I'll wait and see how, how I feel. The, the interesting thing about Ali Smith's writing to me is that I find a lot of it off-putting initially, but if I stick with it, I do find that I enjoy uh, overall a lot of aspects of her writing. She focuses a lot on artists and works art into her writing, which I find very satisfying. Um, some of her wordplay, she loves to play with words, which to me at times I find tiring because I don't always necessarily get those things, but when I do get them, I do find them quite enjoyable. Um, and then the way she writes characters, the way you know characters, it's not completely satisfying to me because I always want a bit more than she gives with her characters, but she can still draw, you know, interesting people that you, that I end up wanting to know about and read about. So usually there's one character that pulls me through and then the other characters flesh out and grow more as the book progresses. Um, so this is set at Christmas time, but it jumps back and forth in timelines. Um, I think there were a lot of references in here to A Christmas Carol. So this idea of a ghost, this idea of moving back and forward in time to create change in your life is definitely a theme in this book. Um, this book is, references Brexit and references the reaction of people in England to um, immigration and um, refugees, um, even though the refugees aren't specifically in England, but it is referenced in here. There's also reference to the um, anti-nuclear war protests that were happening in the 19, late 70s and, and 1980s. Um, there is uh, a, a lot about kind of this uh, truth, truth, and what is true, what is not true is a big theme in here. So I think that's a reference to um, the uh, to President Trump's uh, unveiling of fake news ideas, um, but also um, personal truths and what you believe versus what someone else believes and how you can both have memories of the same thing and they're different. Um, and so which one is true? So those are themes in here. So there's a lot of things in here. There's a lot of layers to Ali Smith's writing. Um, and yeah, I think, I'm again, I'm glad I read it, but it, it like they, they never, I, I don't know if I'd ever really give an Ali Smith a five star. Like that's kind of the way I feel right now. This would be a three and a half star for me. Um, I think I liked Autumn. I think I liked them equally, but, uh, you know, for different reasons. Um, so I, the only, one of the things that bothers me about her writing is that I just, people don't talk to each other the way that Ali Smith writes dialogue. Um, and so I find that to be like, it's a little bit like watching Gilmore Girls or something where these people just talk in these clever snippets um, that, you know, average people just don't talk to each other like that. So I, I, while it's entertaining to read or to listen to, it, 
it, it gets tiring to me because I think, you know, can't they just have a real conversation? Can't they exchange words the way real people would? Um, and then there's the level of fantastical kind of, um, again, kind of ghost, like uh, maybe magical realism, but not really, because um, you're never sure if the things that are happening are real or if they're in the characters' heads. So that's definitely a theme in here as well. Um, and so this is, I mean, if you're looking for a book to read around Christmas time that references Christmas but isn't too um, holiday based, and then I think I would recommend this one. I didn't realize it was more Christmas based. Um, so that's why I read it in February. Um, but that's fine. Um, because I, like I said, it does jump into different months. There's a time moving forward and backward aspect to this book that of course is referencing a Christmas Carol, I think. So yeah, so that is uh, Winter by Ali Smith. Like I said, I don't know if I'll read spring in the spring or if I will take a little break um, because, you know, I like them, but I just don't think that this style of, that Ali Smith's style of writing is going to get a five star from me, um, even though I do find, like, I enjoy it overall. So, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for watching this video and I will be back again soon with another one.